Welcome back. Would have thought that we are facing some technical problems. Hopefully, the audio will remain stable. And at this point, I'd like to welcome Coco, who supports chaos at school in parts, and who clearly is interested in singing birds, as you will be able to find out how these birds can be seen and watched and mapped live, and she will explain to us how that works, and there will be some interactivity, which means that I will use the chaos pad that we have in the wiki, in the pre wiki that we've linked to, I will be watching that wiki, and if you have any questions, you can put them in there, and I will pass them on, and then we will try to work on these questions immediately and turn it into a real interactive experience and a spontaneous workshop. I'm looking forward to that. So, Coco, you go ahead. Yes, thank you for the intro. Uh, thanks for being here. I would like to tell you why you map singing birds at all, why that is important, and how that is organized. And with you, I will then use the QGIS software to um, look at a data set, current data set, to see how, what the population is and uh, where they are. And if you want to join in, it would be good if you could install the QGIS guest desktop now. That is a tool to create maps. And if you get lost, uh, if you want to ask questions, try something else, then use the usual channels, as has been explained just now. Right. I have four or six slides here. I hope you can see them. And the first one asks, why do you actually record birds? You know they are tweeting about on your balcony, but who, why is that interesting? Who is interested in them, in, in that? But in environmental politics and decision making, to have a good foundation for these decisions or to make the right demands from politics, you have to have reliable data. You cannot just say protect the birds. You have to be able to say, well, look, uh, the population of this or that species has been dec declining by 80% in the last few years. We have to save them. And that's why the Federal Republic of Germany, but the EU also is recording some indicators. And these indicators are supposed to reflect how habitats, agrarian areas and others are changing. And these indicators are then used when you have to argue for certain legal changes or whatever. And Germany actually has an indicator called biodiversity and landscape quality, which sounds very comprehensive, but in practice, the whole of this indicator is only related to bird species. So the whole landscape type is connected to the species that you would expect there, and then it, it's checked whether they are still there. And that then gives you a percentage um, saying what the quality is like. And the EU has a number of other indicators, again, related to landscape types and species that are supposed to reflect how intact the nature is. And uh, our German index on biodiversity and landscape quality is divided into landscape type, which is agrarian areas, which is normally where the issues are worst. Forests, who, which uh, are supposed not to have changed, uh, and birds, uh, populations uh, are supposed not to have changed. Uh, we have settled areas, uh, inland waters, and uh, seas. Of course, you have very different birds in each of these. And each landscape type has been assigned a number of species, and the mappers then go out every year and see how many of the birds are still there in certain designated areas. And on that basis, there is an evaluation how intact that landscape is. And in a way, you can say that Germany makes political decisions uh, depending on 
birds, uh, certain spe species, and, and depending on how many of these are flying about. But these data have to come from somewhere. And Germany does not employ tens of thousands of mappers, but these, in fact, are volunteers. And the German Office for Environmental Protection, I think, is the name, uh, has outsourced the whole thing uh, to a, an association of volunteers that has 1,650 volunteers in place. And these are ornithologists. They, they have, have been roped in. Everyone, each of them has a certain area that they uh, um, that go and, and, and map what kinds of birds they saw where. And uh, and we will now deal with this small spot near Hanover, which I have been mapping for the last two years. So I've been out there for eight, uh, eight times altogether, starting in March and ending in June every year. And there are four times preset where you are supposed to be there from sunrise for about two hours. You w walk along a certain line and count. And you can see those red spots. These are the actually assigned areas, which are actually getting mapped and mapped. And the green spots, almost the same number. These are the areas that should be mapped for a representative sample, but for which no volunteer birder has been found yet. Which tells you that our German indicator isn't it has huge gaps for certain landscape types, because it doesn't register the areas that it's supposed to register. So if you know about birds, you are very welcome to show up. It, this really is fun. Right. And then you get to what actually caused me to hold this workshop. And this is a systematic approach. <clears throat> there has been one since 1989. And until the last year, this was very traditional on pen and paper. So we have we were given some printouts of our maps. We went out with those uh, into the landscape or into the settled settled area in my case. And whenever you heard a bird, you wrote you made a note in the map what species that was and maybe what the bird did at the time. So uh, this bird was singing. This bird was feeding, and so on. And after the third time around, you sat down on the computer at home. And you then take a blank blank map for each species and all the birds that you've registered, you copy into that map and you then take another map and you take the next species and, and take that from the all four of the field maps that you had and, and, and put them in there. So you had four field maps uh, that created one species map that had different colors for each watching period and you could then circle in if in a certain period of time you'd saw you'd seen the species uh, then that was regarded as a relatively safe breeding area some species of course migrate some do that early some later in the year and depending on when they migrate uh, that changes where they settle and if I find a certain bird in April a, a tit, perhaps they will, I will think I can then assume that it will be breeding there. And uh, for swifts in April, you will you can be quite certain that they'll be still migrating. Only when you see them, if you see them in around June, you will, can you assume that this is where the bird is actually breeding. So you can then find out what dots you have and in what colors and you can then circle in certain spots. Now, since this year, this has been digitized, digitalized. There is the Natura list. Um, yeah, that is a pun. And uh, that has existed for a few years and everyone that counts birds as a hobby uses this. And that is where you enter your, your random observations uh, there is a portal there that I think is only there to protect, uh, to collect bird observations, and then there are more or less scientific evaluations to run for, for on that basis. And that includes 
the indicators that the state has set up and and the EU uh, and the way they relate to the markings in your area. And you then refer to this platform called Ornito. And uh, so anyone that is vaguely serious in bird watching will enter their data there. And uh, the line you have to walk along as a systematic mapper can be included on the map, can be faded in, and you don't, uh, you actually store the exact coordinates. As you can see in this example, you can choose which species you've seen, how many of these birds I've seen, and what they do. Is it tweeting? Is it just there? There are birds where you can actually determine the sex. Um, so if you have a blackbird, you can, uh, that is quite important and you can distinguish them by color. And if you see that you find two males, you can assume that these are two different territories. If you see a couple, then it's more likely that they belong into one and the same territory. And then that is what you've seen. So you can see have you, if you've seen a bird that is carrying nesting material, then you can assume that this bird is not migrating through, but is actually building a nest in this area. Although it can actually find that nests are given up and the birds move on. Um, if you see a bird carrying food, then you can be quite certain that the bird is actually breeding and has offspring that the bird is feeding. Or maybe you've found a nest, then you can also be quite certain that you are in a breeding area. And that all you can register. I can't, of course, take you into, out into the field right now, sadly. And that's why we'll now see what happens after the field work at home. If you want to join me in clicking, you can now take this address, use this address, and import the point cloud from there, import it into QGIS if you've started QGIS desktop. Now, these are data from people that have actually walked outside and, and entered the data. And after the fourth walk, after a few days of processing, you are then sent this export. And then it's up to you what you do with the data. Ultimately, the territories that you've uh, deduced from that, you are supposed to enter into an Excel sheet and, and send over. And, uh, okay, you've seen the link for a while, and I'll share my screen, and we will now look at and process this geotation together. All right, I hope you have uh, installed QGIS. And now we're going to open up a new project. So now we're going to look at the point cloud. And um, to do so, we're going to pull it into the layer window. So now we have to choose the layer we want to view. This is a polygon which is actually irre irrelevant because it's just um, the outer border of my um, of my data. And now you have a white line, which is a line um, that I walked. And then you have points. And each point represents one um, bird I registered. So what we see are many points that look the same. So the first question is, where are we? And in order to see where we are, we have a very useful extension, which is called Quick Maps Services. You should all install this because it's very handy. I'll just leave it here for everyone to see and to remember the name. And you see the Quick Map services up here in the tool button. And we also um, we can blend in an Osmond map. So um, it's an open street map, map which we can see. So now we see where we are. 
and unfortunately the contrast is very strong so it's difficult to see to spot the points and we can change that in the settings if we adjust the brightness set it up a little bit and if you click apply you see what it looks like So now um, the background map is a little bit paler, so we can see the points very well. Our goal is still to uh, make maps, so let's see what kind of um, data we have. Now we're going to select the layer and look at the attributes. So um, I've named the points after the bird, so let's start with the blackbirds. We have um, points which have characteristics. We all, ha um, all of those are observation types, of course, and then we have a date, which is important because we can see the month I saw the bird in. Well, the species ID isn't so interesting, Atlas code. That is the code for the um, European breeding bird Atlas, which is also collected from these data. And this is what I um, entered on what the bird is doing at the moment. And we have a reference list here with the codes. A1, that means that I've seen the bird. A2 means that the bird was singing. When birds are singing loudly, you um, assume that it's female. Um, worldwide, 70% of all bird species is where the females sing more often. Here in Northern Europe, we also have a phenomenon which is um, that Males are mostly singing, especially when breeding. So um, they're singing to their eggs in order to um, make their hatchlings known with their voice. So if you hear a Northern European bird singing, you can assume that it's male and uh, wants other male birds to go away and leave its territory. And then you have the B codes, um, which are about breeding. You have different types of um, behavior that indicate breeding, for example, building a nest. And then you have the C types, which is about secure breeding. So when a bird is actually sitting in the nest and breeding, or if you see hatchlings, those are behaviors which we have as Atlas codes. ID form, I actually have no idea what this is, but um, species name is the species, of course, and direction is relevant if you're in an open field and you see a bird um, disappear or appear, you can check the direction it's moving in. So, but we, because we're in a populated area and you can't look far into the field, um, I've only a registered sitting birds. So it uh, makes sense to filter by species. So now we just have one species in the map. Are there any questions? Is everyone getting along well? Okay, so I'll just continue. In order to split the map, we're going to go to the editing tool. We want to split the map, so we're looking for the splitter function. Let's see, vector la uh, split vector layer, that looks good. So let's do that. Now we can select the field we want to split by, so um, we say species name, and now we're creating a shape layer for each kind of bird. And we have to tell the computer where it's supposed to go, so I'm opening a repository. So um, 
we're going to make a separate folder because we're going to have many folders in the end. So now we we can't see changes, and we don't uh, want all the species at once. So I've got auxiliary files, and um, the shape file is very important. Let's see what's in it. So let's just drag a file into the viewing window. Let's just hide the other layers. So these are just the blackbirds. Blackbirds? So we still don't see um, in the map what kind um, what kind of activity we saw. So let's continue with the settings and the characteristics. So we have markers here, colored markers, and we're going to opt for rule based. Now, you can refine the rule, so you, you can give it a sense. We want to categorize. So, actually, we would need to sort by date, but um, unfortunately, the dates are in text, as we just saw, like the, the month is written in text. but. You can um, sp split the text. So let's go into an editor and let's um, make numbers from the words. So the first text after a space is our um, month. Because um, in 20th May 2020, for example, May would be the first word after space. And now we found those classes. I don't know what the one without the date means, but um, now we split it, the names of the months. And now we sorted them by um, with this. Now let's apply that. Now we have colored points, and each um, color is one walk. Sometimes I did walks, but um, I didn't find securely breeding birds. So sometimes you have events that are atypical, so um, we need to label them in a way that makes sense later. So let's go to label, and we also want to establish a rule here. A rule based labeling, so now we're adding a rule. We're going to walk, and now we want to paste the date, and we also want to know what did the bird do, so we also need the atlas code. So it's very handy that we have a contact function here. Concat. So we have regits, regix um, that uh, strips the month from the date string, and we're going to concat it with the atlas code. So this should be it. Let's see if it works. Yeah. Now we have the name of the month and the atlas code. So let's close that. And now we can add the OpenStreetMap layer again. We've got a problem here because um, it's very difficult to distinguish between the labels and the street names. So 
we're going to try and find a better way of uh, making it visible. So let's go back into the characteristics. So we have still the labeling selected. And we're going to open it again. So we want a text buffer, which is um, the small space between the um, letters that we see on the map. So let's see. Now we see that it looks better. We have a little white space bet um, behind the letters. So now you, s you can actually read the labelings. We could also add some shadows if we want. That's um, a matter of taste. Personally, I don't like the shadows, so I'm going to remove it. So buffer, yes. Shadow, no. Apply. So that's enough for styling. Now let's look at the reading territories. So um, we're going to zoom them up using our mouse wheel. And now we would have to look into the table, um, which tells us uh, what kind of event we're dealing with and yeah we have a list of species and we have um walk, walk numbers so, um, the number of walks you've seen the birds from which you can consider the bird to be for example definitely breeding so in march no March, April, and June. So we um, are going to look for blackbirds during these walks. Let's go back to Qudis. Where is it? March, April, and May. I'm sorry. So um, in June, blackbirds are already irrelevant because they're back to migrating. So in order to um, map the birds, we need a vector layer of the directory type. No, not this button. Was it this one? Layer of the polytype. So now we have the borders of the territories. They're called paper territories because they're not real territories. Because um, you can't exactly define the territory of a bird because you would have to watch them all day and you would have to watch the bird's behavior and, for example, how they behave um, with neighboring birds. So now um, we're going to find rough territories, so-called paper territories. So we have to save the polygon layer somewhere. I'm going to put it into the species folder and uh, select the species blackbird. Now let's go into the editing mode and start adding objects to the layer. In QGIS you have three types of um, layers. You have points that only contain points, line layers which only contain lines, and polygon layers which only contain polygons. So you don't, uh, you can't really make a mixed layer, but you do three separate li layers which you um, put on top of each other. So now we're going to add a polygon layer to the point layer which we already have. Okay, so we saw a black here at the church in May and in April. So uh, we saw two separate birds. 
Well, um, there was one in June that may have been the same than in May. So what I am going to do now is that I'm going to assume that those words are the same. So I'm assigning them one ID. And maybe this two could also be the same. So I've got two territories here. And then we've got this March and April sighting. In A1, we only saw it, and in A2, it was actually singing. So um, when the bird was singing, I'm assuming that it's male. Maybe I even saw that it's black. And directly in the neighborhood, we had a blackbird that was singing in June and in March and in May. It's interesting that we have different blackbirds um, in March. So those two um, blackbirds are definitely not the same bird. So we can mark two territories. Let's continue up here. We have three um, blackbird sightings in March. There are three different birds because we saw them on one walk. Normally, birds choose landmarks as territory marks. So, for example, they might choose a path um, or a garden or a tree as their territory markers and roads are sometimes dividers between territories. So you may actually have two birds, one in the front garden and one in the back garden. So we've got one bird in May here, but only in May. But birds can fly, so maybe it was just looking for something to eat here. So this is one territory because we saw the same bird in March and April, May and June. That's getting more difficult because this bird has been here in May and here in April. This one in April must be a different bird. Let's continue up here at the cemetery. We have uh, the most birds at the cemetery, actually. We've seen one in May here, and now it, it's getting tricky. We have our first buck. The gender of the bird was saved but it wasn't recognized by uh, QGIS. So we could say two birds in May, two territories, but my memory says otherwise, because I remember that this one was a female and that this one up here was male. So probably we have a couple here. The same up here. I saw two birds in May closely together, two different birds, and I had to look back into my records to see if one of them was brown. In many species of birds, um, the females are green or brown because they sit in the nest most of the time. So it's advantages if they're not recognized so easily by cats or other predators. So the nice and beautiful, colorful females just died out or were eaten. And males, however, actually distract from the female. So they often have one spot that is very colorful. And if, if they show and flash their colors, 
you can assume that they are trying to distract from a nest from their female. So I remember that these were two black blackbirds, so two males. This one is lonely, but so we have one territory here at um, the mayor's office. So it might be one of those who just switched for looking for something to eat. So in order um, to not uh, um, disturb the statistics, um, I'm going to um, just mark it as an uncertain territory and confirm it later. So now I would just enter it into my Excel sheet like that. So we've got 15, 15 Blackbird territories in total. So let's go on with the next bird. We're going to hide the Blackbirds from na for now. Let's see who will choose. Um, Swifts. Um, let's use the black red starts. I'm sure you've all seen them. This is a bird that likes to sing. I sit on rooftops. And I actually haven't seen that one as much as the blackbirds. It would be nice if we could all use the settings we made on the blackbird layer and, and use that for this one as well. That is possible because you can copy the style. So copy style is a command in QGIS. Now we go to the black red start layer. I chose the wrong, the wrong one there. And copy. And then say paste style. And uh, immediately we have these labels separated and, and which include the month and the ID and you can save doing this click a hundred thousand times by simply taking all the maps that you have you've we've had the one with blackbirds already so drag them all into the window which takes a while here they are And you can then select all of them. And paste style again. Now, all the species maps that we had split earlier are there and have the same kinds of labels and the same color codes. Of course, this is now a huge mess of dots so we will now uh, hide all of them. So away with all these layers. For finally, some quiet. Let's get back. Uh, let's get OpenStreetMap back in. And where are the black starts? And you can you do the same with all the other layers. Uh, you can you can do the same thing we did earlier. Um, now create those polygons, the shape layer. Now set the layer to edit, and happily start marking territories for the black red start. I don't think I have to run through the whole process again. It works just as it did earlier with the blackbirds. And once we've finished mapping, we'll now take use the spreadsheet. That is the document we'll send to the German Association of Ornithologists. It looks a bit chaotic, but it isn't because it has all the bird species that are in the catalogue of species to be monitored. 
And of these 99 species, only 20 or so will occur in settled areas. And at the top, I'll enter what kind of landscape we were doing our mapping in. And this was village, garden city, small holdings. Part of the sample area was industry, that was the railway tracks. Now we'll enter the species and which, how many territories in which kind of landscape. And we don't have so many species here. We can search for them, for the ones we want. Okay. Okay, blackbird, we would then enter our blackbird territories and the habitats, the habitat of village or garden city and you guess where are you? Here you are. And then see whether in the industrial areas we found any blackbirds. No, we didn't. If we did, we would enter these birds under industry and other species would occur in, in forests. We didn't have any uh, agrarian areas. You could debate whether cemetery as a landscape type occurred. We had a cemetery, but to not make things too chaotic, sometimes you only really process a landscape type if they are as large as 300 meters. Uh, and because this cemetery was so small, we just added it, or included it in the garden city landscape type, because it doesn't really differ that much from the other landscape. And uh, in the Excel sheet here, in the Excel sheet, we have 23 different species, and that's what you send in together with the shape files, and uh, which are the polygons. And you then leave it to the central office to calculate those indicators, and that is your job as a volunteer done for the year. Right. Now, that was the very first year in which we worked this way, using Naturalist and QGIS, and I think it was a real success, because you still finished earlier, you don't need as much paper, and you can hand your data in via email and not send in a huge envelope. And uh, therefore, I hope that you will have a few questions now. Because I am now basically done with the demonstration. So let's, I have a few more links for you. If you've only seen QGIS now, this is where you can find the software. If you want to learn more about bird monitoring, here's the German link for, for the German Office for protect, for Nature Protection. They have a fairly good German info page. And if you want to join in, uh, either monitoring common breeding birds, or if you haven't got that much experience, then monitoring of rare birds might be more interesting, because there's only one species for you to recognize there, and that is the one you have to search for. And for that, you go to the DDA, the uh, Umbrella Organization of German Avifaunists, and uh, join the forum, say that you're new and what you'd like to monitor. And I, uh, and I don't really, and, and if you are more into it, you can say, I would like to map common birds. And uh, you have to be able to recognize these birds reliably, either by shape or by, by appearance or voice. But you have to be reliable in, in uh, recognizing them. And if you want to join in at the lower level, uh, if you sit outside often and would like to count birds, then have a look at Ornitho, the German portal to um, report bird sightings. And if you only um, can think of questions tomorrow, you can reach me via Twitter or Mastodon, or you can write to me uh, via my NABU, my uh, Ornithologist Association's address. Now I'm through, and I'm interested in your questions. Yeah, thank you, Coco. That was very interesting. And particularly because in these corona times, 
there is a certain side effect. Nature, of course, is more active, at least I felt that. I've actually seen a couple of birds on my shelf, robins. Um, they use the shelf for breeding. Well, well if, if, <laughs> if food is so close, yeah, why not? Uh, I'll have a look at, at the questions. One has been there for a long time. I'll read it in English. Did you consider plug in for the lookup tables that you've used in your talk? Well, since I've only started with QGIS now, I've only, I only really saw what you can do, and writing a plug in would have been a task for the winter. For, for, for it to be used next year. And I would, of course, then offer that to all mappers. Uh, it would have to look good that way. Uh, all that perfectionism. But on the other hand, of course, one or other will now have been have caught on, and um, maybe someone is interested to join in that kind of work. I would be happy if, if someone wanted to do that, because chaos, of course, depends on people coming together and doing interesting things together. So let's have a look at the next question. If the setup will be kept for the coming years, are there plans to extend QGIS for your work? Count the areas, put them directly into Excel? That would be a task for the plug-in again. That would do the counting in the polygon layer and, and transfer the data. And in the next few years, that will gradually perhaps come about. I'm very happy that I can uh, that I was able to use GeoJSON for, for the time being. So even if things are not quite complete yet, but surely by next year it will be more complete. And everyone is just a volunteer, so they can't just program that on the fly. And most mappers are, tend to be somewhat older people, retired people, and all this digitalization is kind of putting them in the, into a very new situation. And uh, they are now busy creating PowerPoint exports, uh, which is an alternative to Ge GeoJSON. And put images into a PowerPoint presentation and all that. Now, for people that aren't really familiar with digital things, these are not nerds that, uh, these are hobby birders or maybe professional biologists who do this in their spare time, or people that do something completely different and have an interest in birds. I cannot expect them to uh, be familiar with coordinates, OSM and all that. And it has to be easily usable, right? You don't want to have to learn kinds of weird things all the time. Yes, it has to be simple. And you don't have to be, you shouldn't have to be an IT expert. And if I write a plug-in, which is a very nice idea, by the way, then it really should simplify working with QGIS for complete novices to, to use that. That's the task. And, and it should correctly export the sex of any observed bird. Yes, I cannot say what would have come out of that because I didn't do the registering. This is kind of experimental. Now, your move direction of movement or the birds? You can actually record bird movement directions in Naturalist. So you can say, this bird isn't stationary on this tree, it moves northwest. Uh, and can then direction of gaze uh, that can be read from the phone, of course, and entered. And the bird's direction, of course, will be more difficult. Another question, which seems quite naive, but actually is probably quite relevant, at which kind of weather should birds be counted? It should be sunny, dry weather, and it should be at sunrise. Because birds, there's, there's a real bird clock where you can find which birds to expect at which time of day. And they start before sunrise, 
And exactly at sunrise, you have the most activity. And the, the, we think that this is because there are fewer insects about in the morning because it's, it's moist and cold. So that is the time when they are awake, but the food is not. And all other activities that have to be made are then carried out at that time. That's why when birds wake up, you have this amazing concert where every, all of them are singing. Everyone basically screaming, this is my territory, I claim this territory for myself and my partner. Yeah, so you try to go out at this, in sunny weather because in dry weather, this is when most birds are active. If it's raining, they tend to hide and tend to not want to sing. So you can expect to not see many of them. You should therefore check the weather forecast. Uh, so if you have a one hour trip to your area and, and start in dry weather, you should check whether it will stay dry. Is it dry or dry and cloudy? And, and if, if there are no clouds, then it, it's worth making the trip and you can expect then uh, for the weather to stay dry and for not to actually drive into a rain. That is an, and that of course is an issue. Most of these areas are quite far outside. Uh, I was lucky, but the other areas I'm assigned have a, require a one hour trip and others have even further to travel. So these might be, these people might be starting out in the night and um, arrive <coughs> in dry weather. So, yeah, are actually assigned a place where to watch birds. No, you choose it. Um, you have the website. I'll just share my screen. You have a list of uh, maps. And you can choose an area um, which is com um, convenient to you from the areas that are so free. We also have a water bird counting event. Now, here you can filter by state, and then you can um, choose a district, and then you have red territories, uh, which are already um, given to someone, and you can't switch because um, data only become illegal um, when a person has watched for two years because um, the statistics purpose is to monitor trends. So it's important that you have a consistent way of monitoring because um, the same person has to have the same error rate. And having someone else watch would lead to inconsistencies. So you're trying to um, exclude systematic errors. So, yeah. Bird ID isn't good enough yet, so we're um, working with humans. So um, here the green areas are still free. So if you want to participate, uh, just choose a green area, look at the details. So, for example, if we want this area here, we would write an email to the coordinator and say, um, like, state our experience in bird watching to make yourself credible. And this area is assigned to you. And you're going to dedicate several years to watching um, the birds. And normally, people do that as long as they live. So, you like the male blackbird claiming the territory and saying, that's my territory. 
Now, one question on how to spot birds. Websites where ecologists share their sightings, could you use those? We do that. We actually do that. Uh, for example, you have ornito.de, which is an ornithologist's platform where ornithologists upload photos of their sightings. And we can actually use the location data from the photos and incorporate them in our uh, research. So there, those are chance sightings that uh, help us get a picture of how many species we have. We have other platforms, an international platform, for example, uh, from an English university that collect sightings with photos, and those are available worldwide. We also have data from Germany, but all Germans ornithologists I know um, use Ornito, but it's a matter of taste against because the websites have a lexicon where beginners can look up bird species and only so is a little bit old fashioned maybe. And there's another platform which I haven't mentioned here where you can upload um, breeding birds, photos of breeding birds and um, you can actually record your um, observations, like for example, what the bird was doing, and they also help scientists identify um, birds and what they're doing. And if you don't know the species, you can upload it as a mystery, and then ornithologists from all over the world try to assign the bird to a species. And also, uh, well, if it's not too exotic, someone will um, actually um, tell you what kind of bird it is. Kind of bird it is. So it's a crossover between geocaching and ornithology. Yeah, exactly. Geocaching is like bird watching for people who don't uh, know about birds. Bird watching, um, really, um, you have to learn it from another person by walking along. But spotting birds, um, the next years, you really need experience and you really need a teacher for that because you really have to listen very closely. It took me 10 years walking along with other bird watchers in order to get a certain kind of um, secure, um, certainty which um, kind of bird I'm watching. When I was a beginner, it was more difficult for me and now I'm more experienced. I'm part of a nature protection group and um, I was uh, part of a walk where we told people what uh, kind of um, bird we're seeing right now. And then unexpectedly, both of the tour leaders died and then we needed someone to replace them. And we didn't, because we didn't want to cancel the event. So I just tried to do that. And so I inherited the task basically of leading the tour. And I became very good at it. And I actually noticed that I had become very good at this and I could actually do it. So I'm now doing um, bird watching tours regularly. So this is something you just acquire over the years. It's not something you can do as a pandemic project, for example. It takes years of dedication, but it's worth it, totally. Or you could um, start during the pandemic, because we've learned that it's uh, very good to be outside in small groups and with a lot of distance to other people. So it's actually a very good thing to do right now. Yeah, now is the best time to begin. So another question. 
The app screenshots in the um, presentation um, they looked different than the ones uh, linked below. Well, those were screenshots from um, and both watching applications which used different maps. So this is where the differences might come from. Maybe they also change? Nah, they're from last week, but uh, it seems I was on another sub page. You get the same information at BFN, DDR, and Ornito, but they always look kind of different. I'm very happy that the pad is very active and that many people are listening and posting questions. Of course, many listeners noticed that your check has um, a nice shape. But that was um, <laughs> that was by chance. I did, um, I did a hard formed um, walk by chance. Yeah, it's cute. So let's see if there's anything obvious or. So there's one question that has been there from the beginning. What kind of hardware do you use? I'll explain it in German. So, in tracking projects, you um, attach um, a GPS sender to birds. In smaller birds, you um, used to use different um, trackers, but now you have trackers that are very lightweight and small. And then you release the bird, and then um, you have uh, the geolocation data, and this is used to um, track the migrating routes because uh, birds, uh, when they migrate, make um, pauses, and sometimes it is used to spot um, abnormal behavior that could indicate an earthquake, for example. And also you try to find the winter um, territories of the birds because uh, obviously you're trying to protect them. So um, you only attach those very expensive um, trackers to a few select birds and for the best data. And then you have lines that go all over the map. If you want to um, participate in, in that as a layman, you have there's an app which you can use um, to um, see like uh, the geolocation data, and then you can um, from home with your spectacles you can see if you see the bird with binoculars, and um, you can double check the data and you can um, also spot behaviors like for example what um, if the birds are feeding or if they're gathering you can um, feed the data with your additional observations so this is a nice thing to do if you are outside if you find a tracked bird you can monitor its behavior and track its behavior also sounds like geocaching. Yeah, it's just outdoor activities with technical equipment. So, 
If it's sunny outside in the morning and you're bird watching, the stereotypical nerd uh, just went to bed, right? Or do you just stay awake all night to go bird watching in the morning at four o'clock? Yeah, two things. In, um, you also have night active birds, night birds. So for night nerds, um, I would recommend birds that are active between 10 in the evening and one o'clock in the morning. Because normal ornithologists want to be awake, so they're sleeping at that time, obviously. Or you can bat watch. Because for bats, you can just um, set out an antenna and then um, you can track the bats and they're actually looking for people for um, that like to do radio um, stuff as a hobby. And then you can um, have a certain type of antenna which is used to track birds and to see them migrating from um, Scandinavia for the You can um, determine the species using ultrasound. So bats are also a night compatible species. So that sounds like we need another talk for that because um, there's so much material to talk about, like ultrasound detectors, building them. That sounds like so much fun. And actually, we actually have that. And I can hear them at night um, with my bare ears. So technical equipment could make it so much more fascinating. Yeah, actually, um, any healthy adult should still be able to hear bats. Because um, you have about 20 kilohertz for a um, for the lower tones which bats make when they're hunting, but uh, when they're not hunting, they make louder sounds that are between 100 and 150 kilohertz. And um, you can hear them quite well when they're hunting, actually, because then they're at 70, 80 kilohertz, and that is, um, you can hear that with a bare ear. But um, we're getting distracted because we were talking about birds. I'm having a lot of fun right now with our bat discussion, but we're at the end of our time slot. So let's have one last look into the pad. And it looks like all questions have been answered. Maybe one observation from the feedback on media.ccc.de you have talks on QGIS and there's also some type of event so if you're into that kind of thing you can um, look at media.ccc.de so now I would like to conclude the talk and I'll also have a look at the pad and um, see if I can answer more questions. Now let's free up the slot. I had and you can see the contact details um, here on the slide. And I'm excited to see if there's more bird um, enthusiasts incoming at uh, the German Nature Protection Association. And I'm also willing to take people along with me and show them what I'm doing. And I would be happy to have participants. And you can also have a look at my Twitter account um, where I post photos of birds and tell you about uh, my daily walks. And I can also take people along for my photo walks. But um, it might be less interesting because you're often disturbing the birds and then they go away. So thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Um.